Good evening. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And this is our third Thursday forum. And tonight we have our guest speakers, and they will introduce themselves in just a moment. Unfortunately, uh, Sue Fulkerson could not be with us tonight, so I'll be sharing a little bit of what she was going to share. And, um, and we hope that you will get a chance to ask questions, and um, we look forward to hearing the stories of our presenters. So tonight, um, and I'm the Reverend Julianne Lupp, sorry uh, to forget to say my name. Um, tonight we're talking about spiritual practices to help manage stress and anxiety. And even in normal times, that's a challenge. And as we know, for the past few years, that has been quite a challenge. And many people have uh, turned their lives around in different ways and, and tried to find answers and, and solutions. So this is what Sue Fulkerson says that she does for her spiritual practice. The first one is heeding the call. And C is for create, she says. I believe everyone is born to be an artist, but people spend their whole lives holding their breath because of fear. Fear of failure, fear of judgment, and fear of disappointing themselves and others. Since I worried about the dichotomy of adolescents often so trapped in their need to be both completely different than their peers and completely the same, I found that experiences in the arts where they can lose themselves in the creation process, especially if they experience the flow, they can stop feeling stress and anxiety. A is accept. I have found adolescents are often less comfortable accepting and acknowledging their accomplishments than adults. So working to help them accept the smallest pieces of their work and to identify what pieces appear to challenge them can help them feel increasing worth, which reduces anxiety. And she also has awe, like A-W-E, not awe. <laughs> I have not seen any activity which has helped people of any age step away from their own concerns more than choosing to always be on the outlook for awe. The absolute joy of an observer witnesses on the on the awe observer's face or body language is proof that awe searches are one, um, awe searches, I'm sorry, I'm losing my place, are worth the time and effort when one is feeling stressed. Stepping away from self to truly pay attention to something outside of your perspective. And then she says, listen, I have never felt more loved than the times when others have looked me directly in the eyes without any attempts to fix me, but only to provide holy witness. When I can do that for others, it feels like the highest service I could possibly provide. And then she has learn. I know teaching will always be my life. Sue Fulkerson is a retired teacher, a very gifted teacher. And since I learn as much, if not more, when I teach, I am so grateful that teaching opportunities seem to materialize without even searching them out. And then she wanted to close with this quote from T.H. White, the once and future king. The best thing for being sad, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn something. That's the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder in your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics or your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. But there is only one thing for it, to learn. Learn why the world wags what it wags. That is the only thing which the mind can never exhaust never alienate, never tortured by, never fear or never distressed, and never dream of regretting. Learning is the only thing for you. Look at what a lot of things there are to learn. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kiri, and uh, maybe you can introduce yourself, and Lacey can do the same, and we can get started. That'd be great. Okay, thanks so much, Julie. Thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone who came out tonight in person. Hello to everybody online and everyone who's going to be watching the recording. Um, I'm Carrie Kernan, 
and I live here in Eau Claire, a newer member of UU, longtime groupie. And um, I am a local herbalist, and um, I practice out of my business called River Prairie Apothecary. Um, I also have an art background. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and got a Bachelor of Fine Arts with an emphasis in photography. So I'll be coming at you from a naturalist, herbalist, artist perspective. Awesome to meet you, and it's great to be with all of you this evening. It's great to see you and be here in person. It's been a while since I was here. Um, hi, everybody that's online. Um, I'm Lacey Heward. I've been a member for, I think, about two years, and I am bringing uh, my experience being a peer recovery specialist. Um, and working with people in all levels and forms of recovery, everything from addiction recovery to trauma recovery, children and adults, and also a lifetime of recovery. Um, I kind of wear that exterior, um, in my exterior, so it's kind of obvious. Um, so I bring that experience as well. It's really great to meet you, Lacey. <laughs> um, so something I wanted to start with, um, you'll get to hear us speak here, and I'm so grateful that Sue sent that wonderful writing. As, that's a great foundation, and I knew um, what I kind of wanted to talk on would probably be similar to the, the subjects brought up by my, my peers here, so I'm happy to say that some of the things that Sue touched on um, are also really important to me. Uh, but to start, um, beyond listening and getting to speak, I wanted to actually share a practice with you that I thought might do well to set the tone. And I see some of you actually taking some deep breaths. You're on. You know what I'm going to do. And um, it's also for me, so that I can really um, tap into my, my, my spiritual being and meet you all here as spiritual beings. So. Um, some of you might be familiar with this particular breathing exercise. It's called box breathing. So we'll do just a couple rounds of that, and the purpose for it is that um, through the breath, you can, you can center, and it sort of gives you something to, to think of, to visualize, to count and do with your mind, so it doesn't wander off. Um, and then I'm going to add on to a, a little bit. And so it might so happen that we have different sized lungs here and online. So if my counting is not quite right for you, definitely do this on your own time, but I'll guide you for now. So um, just to talk you through it first, um, we exhale for four counts, and then we pause at the emptiness for four counts, and we inhale for four counts, and then we pause at the fullness for four counts. So that's the box that you can imagine, okay? So just take a breath and fully exit, exhale. Two, three, four, pause at the empty. Three, four, inhale. Two, three, four, and hold. Two, three, four, exhale. Two, three, four, and hold. Two, three, four. Inhale. Two, three, four. And hold. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three, four. Everyone looks so peaceful in here. <laughs> so um, when you find yourself in a moment where you feel pulled, perhaps, into worries of the future, anxieties, um, pulled into the past, I'd call that sometimes within myself, I'm, you know, maybe pondering something from the past in a more depressive state, or when I'm in a situation where um, I'm experiencing stress that is making me want to either get angry, the fight response, or freeze, or flight or even fawn, where I lean into something that I'm later gonna regret. This is a really good secret thing to be doing that will help you find your grounding in the moment. So, 
since we're here to talk about um, spiritual practice, for me, what that means as an herbalist is um, actually I spend a lot of time in the woods and, um, you know, it's true, the last handful of years have certainly um, encouraged me to find some practices to help me get through. And especially as an herbalist, it's oh so important for me to show up for clients in a very healthy, um, grounded way. Um, so it started out as, as something I did for fun or because my dog makes me go outside in the woods. Um, but I've, I've found myself probably um, using the time I spent in nature as my number one healing tool. And when people would ask me, what's your favorite plant? Um, depending on who I, would, I was talking to, if I wanted to sound cool and knowledgeable, I could rattle off some plants. But, you know, really just like being in their presence and being outside, being in the environment, not a perfect environment, normally imperfect for me. One of my favorite hiking spots is a creek that goes underneath a highway, um, which is like the perfect practice for, you know, we live in the world as is and we still need to find these spaces of awe. So, Bringing it back to that breathing exercise, you're going to get to do it one more time, but I'm going to teach you one more thing that you can do with it to make it even more powerful and to bring the spirit of nature into, into the practice. So um, we had a box before. Uh, now we can imagine a circle. And there's an X, which slices it into four pieces of pie. And um, on your exhale, you can guess what season that is. We're in it, actually. <sighs> Fall. And we pause in the winter. And we inhale with the spring. We do a really good inhale in these parts when that spring finally comes. And we are full in the summer. And obviously, we can't hold that all the time. And then we exhale in the fall. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so when we're going through that, you can just think the word spring, and I'll do the counting, and I'll kind of do some hand motions to remind you if we're um, inhaling, holding, exhaling, and um, pausing at the, the bottom. Um, you can also visualize different parts of the seasons that light you up. So if it's imagining a tree going through the seasons, if it's imagining yourself outside in a place, Whatever those seasons mean to you is what you can envision. So we're going to do that again, and um, I'm going to do three rounds this time, okay? So just take a normal breath, and exhale, fall, two, three, four, pause, winter, three, four, inhale, spring, three, four, and pause, fullness, Summer, four, exhale, fall, three, four, pause, empty, winter, four, inhale, spring, three, four, fullness, summer, pause, four, exhale, fall, two, three, and pause, winter, three, four. Inhale, spring, three, four, and pause, fullness, three, four, exhale, fall, three, four, and pause, winter, three, four. I lost track of how many seasons we went through, but <laughs> it felt right to stop there. Um, Thank you for doing that with me, and I hope that that's a practical tool you can use. Um, the thing that I love about that tool isn't just that it can help us in stressful, anxious, acute times, um, but it personally, for me, being on this herbal path, answers some big questions I've been holding that I started asking maybe over a decade ago. And one of them was, why? Like, why do the plants want to help us? 
because I'm pretty sure we're the ones making it a little hard for them. And I was just like so honestly, existentially confused about this for a while. And I tried on a lot of ideas and I was like, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, healthier people will like go do more and do better things for the earth. I just like held this question for a long time. And with the help of some amazing teachers, um, one of them maybe you're familiar with, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, she wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, if you're liking anything of what I'm saying, I'm highly inspired by her and she planted some good seeds in me a while ago. Um, she was the one that made me really consider the way in which I was looking at the plant world, which was quite separate. Because that question that I had only makes sense if you believe that you're separate from nature. Um, and the reason why that exercise reminds me that we're not separate from nature is because it mimics so many other cycles within other cycles. So just the way in which we breathe mirrors the seasons. And there's even smaller cycles within that. There's, there's the cycle, there's a cycle of the moon, you know, and we're all, we, we all have water in us. It's, it's not just people with a uterus that are affected by the moon and cycling. Um, I've, I, one of my really good friends worked at a gas station and she can affirm that like weird things, people come out of the woodwork around the full moon. It just is. If you've worked in people service, like maybe you can affirm this as well. We, we are affected by these cycles. And then there's the smaller cycles, the circadian rhythm, right? Our daily rhythms. So there's so many things, and I'm gonna build on what Sue said, um, is this, this feeling of awe, a, Ah, <laughs> not the Wisconsin ol. Ah, um, I have ended up on this herbal path because of the ah, you know, the things that just stop me in my tracks as I go into the woods, bumbling and grumbling in my snowsuit, and I don't want to be out there. And then I stumble upon something, and it just reminds me. I just see some sort of narrative in it or some story, and it makes me feel like. Um, I belong on this planet. Like there's some rhyme and reason to things going on around me. I think that's the most comforting thing that I find in nature. And um, before I, I pass the airtime over to Lacey, I'll wrap that up with um, some, something that I often see in people, most people that I work with, um, is anxiety whether or not they're aware of it. A lot of people are aware of it, and, and herbs are wonderful for that. Um, but I ponder this a lot. This has been one of my existential ponderings questions that I've held as I go out into nature looking for answers. Why is it, you know, why is it that we all feel this way, and what are we supposed to do about it? Um, and I myself, actually, I, again, another synchronicity, like I, I too am in recovery. Um, I did a lot of like seeking and searching for ways in which to feel better, to like not feel this low grade pain. So anyways, um, I do believe that because we are living beings on this earth and we are oh, oh so interconnected to so many things around us, there is a low grade level of anxiety that exists um, because of this disconnection from this very place that sustains us and where we live. It's actually wild. It hasn't been all that long that people have forgotten this, at least in, you know, a westernized um, culture. So um, I'm sure we'll get to build on this maybe perhaps a little bit more, but um, you don't need to spend 95% of your time rambling around the woods. That's not reasonable, so I'm, I'll do it for you, and I'm here to tell you that um, we are very much connected to the earth and the earth continues this open invitation for us to heal, be it physically, emotionally, or spiritually, and that anything you do for any parts of 
yourself concerning those different parts ripples out in ways in which we might not be able to sense with our five senses, but it is real and important and um, even when it seems like things are overwhelming, it's, it makes a bigger difference than you would ever think or could comprehend. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was so lovely. I loved the meditation. Thank you for giving us a, um, an example and a taste of that, um, that awe and connection to each other. And that's actually um, what I wanted to talk about tonight is um, our connection to one another. And we are natural beings, and I just love that you brought that here, that, um, that reminder that we are not separate. Um, that's really it just hits home, right? It feels like home. Um, gosh, um, that, that piece about awe is just about exactly, um, I wrote it down here, um, cause I am having a hard time with my short term memory lately. Um, that is just exactly nails it, doesn't it? Um, when we're feeling super lost and stressed and anxious, uh, yeah, that awe, uh, that sense of wonder really brings it, brings it home. I loved the piece that Sue wrote about losing ourselves in the art and Um, you know, I have a lifetime of medical trauma <laughs> and experiences of total distress. Um, it would take days <laughs> for me to go through all of it with you. But when I was contemplating this idea of reaching for uh, our spirituality in those times of need, I just kept coming back to this time in my life as a child. It was a really hard time. I was sent away um, to a hospital for really major uh, hip reconstructive surgery. It was a very long surgery. I lost a ton of blood. I almost died. I had to have a transfusion. It was just a nightmare. Um, I was eight years old, and I was th for three months away from my family. It was really hard. It was really traumatic. But something happened there that I realized I kind of learned how to do, learned how to cope, and I have taken that with me. And there's something that happens when you sit in solitude long enough. Um, when you lay in, in bed at night and the lights go off at 10 o'clock and you're in this ward of all these little girls, some of them are crying for their moms, you, you know, silently crying for your mom. And over time, over the hours as they kind of tick by and you're kind of looking around, something happens. You start to forget about your pain. You just have like this little glimmer of like, what? I wonder why the, the walls are green. Oh, that's a really interesting color of green. Um, I wonder if I can, if I reach around, if I can reach my Barbie dolls. You know, can I play with my Barbie dolls while no one's looking? Um, so there's these moments when you're really suffering, right? You're really having a hard time, but there's a break. There's this small break. And in that break, in that moment, is an opportunity. And as a child, the opportunity was to invite the imagination. And so that became my awe. That became that awe. Um, you know, telling myself stories, getting lost, losing, totally losing focus of being away from my family and hurting. I had to be in this 
really awful body cast for months and months. And, but pretty soon, it just didn't matter what was going in this state right now because I had invi invited the imagination to come and join me and be in this very strange, awkward place of separation. But that, that connected me. And when we invite the imagination to that little break, that little moment, then we also have a new sense of curiosity and wonder. And we start asking really interesting questions like, why are the walls green or cream colored? Or, you know, I wonder who did that window? Um, you know, I wonder how long this church has been here? Things that, questions that are not heavy questions, right? Like, I wonder what's gonna happen tomorrow with that divorce. Uh, I wonder what's gonna happen now that I lost my job. Um, am I ever gonna walk again? Am I ever gonna breathe normally again, right? Those are some super heavy hitters. Those are deep, hard questions. But when we invite the imagination, our curiosity shifts the focus to something that's just a little bit out there, well, maybe even silly. Like, I wonder what would happen if I just chucked all my dishes and didn't wash them. That would be <laughs> interesting. <laughs> In those moments of that kind of wonder and strange curiosity, we have an opportunity then to reach. We can reach for something else, a possibility. Yes, I'm sitting here and I'm hurting and I miss my mommy and I'm having a super duper hard time, but what's possible? What else is possible? I'll give you an example. My favorite thing to do while I was in this horrible hospital situation feeling totally neglected, but I didn't have a word for it. I played with my Barbies, but I had a great problem-solving solution, and that was to ask for an ice pack just before dinner if we were having pizza, because then I could put the hot plate of pizza on the ice pack and melt it, and then I would have a Barbie waterbed. <laughs> Those are the kind of problems that children solve, right? <laughs> and that is what I've taken with me as I've grown older, is that reaching, that reaching for something, being curious about something that's maybe just beyond uh, the reach of this present moment right here. I was um, getting ready for a kidney transplant, and I had to go and do this test. And it, they had to give me a, I, I mean, so there's a name for this procedure. I don't know what it is. But they had to give me an injection of dye into my artery, and then it would kind of light up all of my veins and blood vessels. and arteries so they could see if there was any kind of blockage. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of out of it. I'm laying on this very hard, uncomfortable bed in this cold, sterile room, and there's this huge, huge TV screen in front of me. And I'm laying there, and I'm kind of groggy, and I'm out of it. And then something hurts so bad. Oh my gosh, that hurts. And I sit up. <laughs> I'm not supposed to sit up. And I look at this TV screen, and I go, wow, there's a tree. I see a tree and it's lit up. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen in me, in my body. And yeah, it hurt, but there was that break. There was that tiny moment of wonder and magic. Like, holy cow, that's inside of me? It looks just like a tree. Those are the moments that we can reach for something different, remember it in a different way, kind of grasp and hold on 
to something that is of wonder. Um, my sister is a counselor, she's a trauma counselor, and she, has, she learns all these really cool things. And something that she told me recently is that people's hearts sync up. When you make a connection with someone, your hearts beat together. How cool is that? I didn't really believe her until I read the research because I have a hard time breathing, you know, with my husband when we're sleeping by each other. I don't know, our breathing does not sync up. And he snores and then I snore, it doesn't work. So I'm like, really, our hearts really sync up? Okay. Well, that's that piece that we're connected so we can reach for each other too. I don't have to sit there, lay in, you know, this horrible suffering by ourselves and feel alone in that moment of that break, that break from your pain, that break from your stress, anxiety, depression. Just that moment is an opportunity to reach and possibly for each other and feel that connection because we are, we're connected to each other. Our hearts look like trees. <laughs> it's amazing. And that is what I've realized is an incredible part of recovery too, is that we, in connection and communion, create wonder, create that space of imagination together. It looks different for everybody, but perhaps, just perhaps for that brief moment, we can experience that awe. Yeah, thank you. That was so beautiful. We got, oh, Julie's coming back up. So um, we have two very interesting and gifted folks here, um, and, and I uh, wanted to give uh, a chance for people online to ask questions, and also uh, those of you here, and um, I'm going to borrow one of your microphones, if that's okay, and please raise your hand if you have a question for um, Carrie and Lacey, and they can both answer, maybe. I think I'll, I'll start us off. Um, what, um, during uh, the isolation of the pandemic, what was the spiritual practice that really kept you um, hopeful? You know, what is it that um, connected you the most um, with, with joy or just gave you a little bit of hope? All right, so um, things that kept me hopeful um, through the last couple of years, yeah. Uh, I'd say there's a two-part practice that kind of builds on what, what Lacey shared um, with this, like, having curiosity around your environment. And for me, the other part of that was something that's called somatic um, practice. And so that's where um, you kind of use the body and perhaps it's different movements. Um, maybe you can even expand more on this. Um, I've just kind of dabble uh, for myself. But I had realized that I had gotten a bit of like dissonance between where my mind was at and what my, my being, like my, where my body was at. There was, you know, just like for me, I, I dove into learning, you know. Um, to try and keep my wits about me, but it's almost as if I was putting on too many new beliefs, and I was like, okay, I got this, but meanwhile, my body's just kind of like, I'm still stuck over here with all these crazy things that are happening. And what I found was like from when I finally took the time to um, do a little of the somatic work, so what that was, for example, this one practice I was getting to do was you're supposed to just simply tap into your heart space and um, ask what's there. 
And when I did that, I realized that some of these other things that I was working on, my body hadn't caught up with yet. And for me, it was actually a, a hard thing to realize that. I had a lot of grief around that. However, the hopeful piece in this was that. When I was working on you know, finding ways to engage my mind to stay sane, um, I ended up looking outside of myself so much for what to think and how to feel and what's right and what should I do that it almost made me feel like I couldn't trust myself, I think. I couldn't believe my own thoughts sometimes, which is a horrible feeling. And when I found this somatic work, I was like, oh my, this is, some, this is something that I want to look into a little bit more. So um, just knowing that I would have a way to trust myself again and find answers from within um, that we all know is, you know, we're never just truly alone. There's, there's probably things coming through all of us that are similar that we're, we're working, working on. Um, that really helped me. That really helped me um, get out of a pretty stuck space to be able to get out there again and, and do the work that I love to do to be able to show up for people again. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there, I mean, what a hard time. It was such a, such a hard time. And something that I forgot to mention is, um, you know, we talk about the mystery often, especially in our church. Um, that, and I feel like that, that sense of awe and it is the mystery. And the imagination is a way of inviting the mystery too. Forgot to mention that. <laughs> um, so what helped me and supported me to feel hopeful going through all of that? You know, it, it didn't feel like it started with the pandemic. <laughs> it felt like it started before that. Um, like we were going through it, you know, the two years beforehand. Um, so I also, I also dug in. Um, you know, I had that time to sit in solitude and really be with myself. And I started having panic attacks. I was having a super hard time. I just was overwhelmed with worry, uh, fear for my health. Was I gonna live through the darn thing? We're, you know, far away from my family. My family is spread out all across the country. Worried if I would ever see them again. I mean, I was literally preparing for my doom. And it was in those, those moments of, uh, you know, those moments of that break and really going into nature really helped to kind of put space uh, between those really heavy thoughts, right? Those really heavy feelings. And I would say that, that really gave me a ton of hope. Um, it, there's actually something that happens in your brain too your brain chemistry and the way that our brains work is that if you stay focused and kind of obsess over a worst case scenario and you just stay in your pain and suffering, then you're just pumping your body full, full of cortisol and you just stay in the amygdala, which is like your lizard brain. But if you can just, like I said, kind of reach outside of that to something, anything, you know, something mundane, washing dishes, um, vacuuming, um, and, and ask those other questions. It can give you that break from those super heavy duty, uh, heavy things to give you a glimmer of that hope. And that's what really helped me get through it. I'm sort of changing topics, but I wondered how, what you would advise people or help people. I mean, we all know companionship.
pocket. <laughs> You've alluded to especially Lacey that you need to. If you hold that button down, I can come and give you this one. If you turn that one off. The hot one. <laughs> Uh, Lacey talked a little bit about companionship and sort of the communion of companionship. But what would you, how would you help people that anxiety, they have a lot of anxiety over companionships, like some of their anxiety groups that they would be helpful for them to go to, they just have, are so anxious to, to go into meet people. It's like they're thinking of people as something that expects something of, of them versus something that could be compassionate toward them. So how would you help all of us that have this slightly overreaction that sometimes we think going in a group is gonna just make people expect something of us versus people are there to affirm us? Yeah, that validation, right? Like wanting to, to be valid and to belong. But it's scary to take that step into the unknown of what's what's going to happen when I show up? What is gonna happen when I show up? I don't know, maybe someone will jump out at me from the closet and scare me. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll trip and fall on my face and, or maybe I'll say a totally dumb thing. Um, I don't know, I don't know what will happen. Um, there's only one way to find out, and that's to go on an adventure. You know, get curious and really dig into that question. What's going to happen? Let's go. Let's do this. Let's just go as big and as bold as we possibly can and just rat them, cowboy. Here we go. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, just kind of stepping into that that space of unknown and and just kind of diving into the fear. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, and I love bringing in worst case scenario in a funny way, like the use of humor to break kind of the anxious swirling patterns of thought that are not helpful is so helpful. Um, the other thing I always remind myself is that everybody feels that way to some extent. Even people sitting up in front playing it cool. Um, I also generally feel quite awkward when I'm in a group of people most of the time, but um, you may or may not guess that. And um, also, for me, I try and remind myself how nice it is to just like if I were to be able to totally be myself, my weird self, my imperfect self, and just like go ahead and show the flaws and like see who stays and see who goes, and it'll save so much time in my life, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, a quick short story. I was like a volunteer coordinator for this AmeriCorps job in California, and I was on a campus where I knew like nobody. And I had to quick get some volunteers and quick get this program launched. So what did I do? I took a hula hoop and just sort of set up on campus. And I was like, this is going to attract the weirdos. And this is going to repel the people who are going to be weirded out by me at some point. And it was a storytelling group. So it was like, you know, I needed kind of fun, goofy college volunteers who'd be willing to put themselves out there and be silly in front of children. And this, by the way, I tried a lot of other things before this to get volunteers. I tried a lot of more rational, normal things, and it didn't work. And finally, when I did that, I think I learned something about myself that made me regret the way in which I showed up, you know, in high school. Probably we all tried to be cool, or I don't know, that's what I did in high school. And when I finally found my people at that point in my life, I was like, darn it. Oh, well, I'll start now. But anyways, it's never too late, especially when we continue to find new versions of ourselves as we go through things to keep showing up as we are. And that means that we're going to lose people. I mean, that has really been something that I've had to sit with also, um, giving up drinking and giving up other things that I numbed with each time I let those things go. 
I became someone new and people transitioned out of my life and new, new people transitioned in and things I thought I liked, turns out I didn't and new things come in. So for me, it's just, just trusting, trusting what feels good and then trying to listen. If it doesn't feel good, just like don't do it. <laughs> but, but, you know, do put yourself in, in spaces that are the good, healthy stress that you're like, ooh, can I do it? I want to, but I don't know. That's like good stress exercise for your, for your system. There's a word for it. There's a scientific word for that type of stress that's good for our systems, but it actually prepares us to handle stress, like the, the bad stress, because it teaches our system that we can overcome things that are a little trying, but we want to do it. Yeah, good question. Well, I'm a worrier, <laughs> and I worry about things that haven't happened yet or may not happen. And it's really hard to get out of my mind. I don't know if it's, I'm always thinking of the worst thing that's gonna happen, but it's like I need to think of all these things that could happen, and I think, how do I get that out of my, my mind? Um, and my, my children kid me about it. <laughs> so you always have to have something to worry about, but it's, it's tiring. Whatever kind of response we have to the hardships that we go through in life are okay. It's a, it's a perfectly normal response and to protect ourselves by asking every question and look at every scenario that can go, go wrong. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay that you worry and 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 use that as a way to protect yourself from the unknown, the fear that one of those things is going to happen and at least you'll be prepared, right? You already thought about that scenario. So you're going to be ready for it when it, you know, comes and punches you in the shoulder. Yeah, it's okay. You know, there's no right and wrong way to do this. Um, yeah, everybody, anything people choose to do to cope is okay. Um, getting super angry and punching a wall is uh, something that I hear about often. And hey, that's a, that is a, a way of coping. Drinking is a way of coping. Uh, drugs are a way of coping, isolating, all of those things. And it's just our way uh, that we protect ourselves and help to kind of get through really hard things. And so then the question becomes, how long do we want to continue to use that as our coping mechanism? Is there another one that we would like to use? So what, what do we want it to be like? What do we want our response to be like? How would we like to feel? Um, yeah, that kind of stepping into that space of, oh yeah, I would actually really like to feel calm and at peace when I approach um, my fears or when I approach something that feels really unknown. Um, and just try that and see if that works. And if it doesn't, um, then you can move on to something else or, but I, I, w I wanna say the biggest thing is be kind to yourself. Just be kind to yourself and realize that you're doing the best that you can right now. I love your response to that question because I too agree that carrying around guilt and shame around anything doesn't help at all, ever. And no one asks that of us, and we're probably the only ones that do that to ourselves. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, reference the old UWEC and, and talk about the power of and here. And um, 
you can say, you know, take what you think might be a fault and, and turn it into a superpower. If you remove the guilt and shame of it, like, I am a person that thinks way ahead, and I think of all of the things, and I'm going to go do this thing anyways, even though I've thought of all the things that could go wrong about it. What the heck? Um, I, would, I would also add that um, we, we live in a westernized culture that kind of, I think, forces that role upon women to be warriors, you know? Um, so maybe perhaps um, tapping into something that Lacey said, you can play with archetypes. If there is a certain persona you want to be for five minutes and just be like, how would this person react to this situation? Or before I'm about to go into this party or thing, I'm just going to try on this, this mask. Not to hide myself and not to be something that I'm not, but just to like get myself out of the fight or flight. Really, that's what you're doing. We use creativity. Um, we use all these different kind of hacks to get ourselves out of the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response, which you know, worrying about something is, is one of those trauma responses. And um, I think also for, for many people, you know, maybe you're discrediting something very powerful in yourself. Maybe being in that way has actually gotten you through some, some things in your life. You know, like everything our minds do and everything our bodies do, even though it can be real annoying and really inconvenient, they're doing it for like some reason. And maybe you can speak on this a little bit more as far as like, um, I, I, see, I see anxiety as a trauma response, really, if it's mild, if it's severe. So what that means is it's like your body or your mind doing the best that it can to keep you safe, like what Lacey had said. So however you can reframe your thinking around it as something that's actually of value in your life, it's worth doing it because in my experience, like shoving away thoughts and shoving away feelings and shoving away ways in which I repeatedly show up in the world just doesn't work. So I was like, all right, come along. Here we go. Get in the car. I got my anxiety. I got my like addictive self. Like, let's go. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm really upfront about um, things. And that has been really helpful for me because then it gives me this freedom to just, to just be and it's one less thing I need to worry about. So maybe for you, finding a way to find some humor in it, throw it back at your kids when they're giving you a hard time. Um, yeah, and thanks to all the moms who do all the worrying out there too, and we're sorry. Yeah, I just have like one more kind of little tool hack. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave enough time for you to put in something yet too, okay. Um, so when I was preparing for this talk, normally what I do before I teach, I, I teach herbalism and how to, you know, teach people how to make things and, and do things for themselves. Normally part of my preparation process is to just like dive into the resources and refresh my mind with like cool facts and things so that, you know, there's, there's a certain percent of the population that won't listen to you if they think they're smarter than you. So I always usually like have my facts ready to go. But I was like, you know what? For this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my thing, go into nature, tune into my heart space, and just be open to what we need to ponder. And I admit, I like went into the woods with my, with my earbud in, and I was totally listening to a talk um, until finally I was just like, oh, all right, this isn't working. I took my earbud out, turned my phone all the way off, and went to stand at this point next to the creek where I've stood I don't know how many times before and I'm like oh, okay I'm gonna go look at the water and I see you know the sun setting this was yesterday um, so it was wasn't too cold and I'm like oh okay yeah beautiful golden light oh there's the highway everyone going home from work it's like 5 30 it's really noisy I'm like oh, okay that's okay that's okay and my eyes drift down to the water and I see two trees 
over the creek. And right away I notice this cup of garbage just like stuck in this eddy, floating around. I'm like, ah, oh, humans, you know. I'm like, ah, oh, but it's okay. And then in between these two trees, there's like water that was bubbling up underneath the first log. And it was just like coming up like infinitely. And it was so clean. I was like, wow, look at that. If you didn't see all that like muck on the other side, garbage and whatever that like someone threw out of their car where the highway goes over the creek not too far away, you would never know. And I was like, ah, yes, this is a story of boundaries. This is something like that for me personally, without going into too much detail on that, I'm always pondering. So I'm like, ah, okay, so this represents um, open-hearted boundaries because we've got this water flowing in and it's keeping out the muck. And then this other tree that was over the water, the, 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 across the creek, the water was going over it and act actually oxygenating. So I was like, cool, look at that. Like here's the water flowing and getting oxygenated and it's actually better off for all these creatures that live in the water downstream. And having an art background and also trying to be open to finding story and having curiosity about the world around me and always having questions I'm kind of, you know, looking for answers to. I couldn't help but look at that creek in that moment and just see it as this, this perfect picture to remind me of exactly how I want to show up in the world where I'm not demanding perfection. I don't need a perfect, pristine creek, but it's this sweet little, sometimes garbagey, sometimes runoff creek, um, and I don't need to worry about like, oh gosh, should I like scramble down there and get their garbage out? No, like some storm's gonna come through and wash the garbage away. And to just be present in that, that space and let life flow into you, and when you let it flow into you, it's gonna keep rippling down, and it'll probably be better off because it came through you. Um, I tend to be a person that's on the like, ooh, give it away side, like I love that. I, I love giving things and, and helping people. And for me, I always try to focus on the, the refilling side. So that's just like a small example of going, for me, you can go into nature or you can listen, you could look at pictures, you could smell smells of nature, like our brain, as, as um, you know, advanced as we are, there's a part of our brain that any sense of nature instantly makes it feel very calm. Um, so the tool I'll leave you with is, um, you know, take, take note of your surroundings, you know? You can think in terms of like millions of years where you're like, wow, why is there a valley here? Gee, it's flat here. For me as an herbalist, I'm like, why do these trees grow here? Huh, wetlands, what about that? And you get to know these places and you feel less and less alone actually, especially every spring as you get to see your, your pals, your friends, your plants returning. Perhaps it might just be that one tree outside of where you live or even those dang amazing weeds growing through the crack currently that are still green despite many nights of it being 20 degrees. Um, but that you can find a way to live within an imperfect world and find that awe and find that beauty and just come up with as many questions as you can. And in being aware and developing an appreciation for the space where you are, um, you become connected to so many more people who also care for that space. People who came before you and people who are yet to come. And for me, that is just like one of the most comforting thoughts that my brain can come up with. I really, I've really been enjoying this time with you and your answers are so cool and we've really gotten some great wisdom and tools from you, it's so cool. Thank you so much, I'm so glad. It's an honor to be here with you and be invited to this space. Thank you all so much for coming and, and sharing this space together. It's really powerful. Um, it's spiritual. Yeah, we are communing together. It's really nice. Ah, it feels really good. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, thank
Thank you very much for coming tonight. I hope you'll all think about maybe one thing that you gained um, to, to take into hard days and, um, and maybe find beauty and awe and, and those practices that help us get through hard times. Let's give our speakers a, a round of applause and um, go in peace and go in love.